Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the podcast or the Zoomcast, which is the new forum for uh, having the chance to interview people. And I think that uh, everybody that's listening to this or watching this is really going to enjoy for a couple of reasons. So I have an opportunity to be speaking today with uh, someone who's become a friend and somebody who I admire and who has really made um, very recently a, a tremendous accomplishment that I think you're all going to want to hear about. So his name is Grant Johnson, and he's the CEO of a company called Esports Entertainment Group. And what he's done is he just recently listed his company on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. But what I want to focus on today is, um, well, there's so many things I want to focus on. I want to focus upon that journey. I want to focus upon of how do you take a company that, um, I think it was a reverse merger. We'll get into that. How do we go from there to the OTC to the NASDAQ? Then I want to talk about um, what did it take to build a successful company? But then I want to talk about this incredible industry that's called esports, which I'm not even sure I understand. So let me back up. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the podcast, Grant. How are you? How are you holding up out there? Uh, great. Thanks for having me. Of course, I'm in the same uh, situation with, like everybody. Well, not you. You're in your office. You're you're one of the very few. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> essential. We're essential. Yeah, you're essential. <laughs> Well, absolutely. It was your essential, as you know, you're <laughs> burned up right now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. So, so, so let's back up. Before we get into your journey, um, you know, educate me from a layman standpoint. You know, when I think of esports, um, I think of a couple things. I think of me yelling at my kids to stop playing Fortnite. Um, and then recently, I think of the fact that I've become... Uh, a bit of an addict on uh, on Netflix, watching uh, the NASCAR Formula One, not NASCAR Formula One racing, and I've heard that's transitioning to to esports. Yeah. And then, especially over the last six weeks, with the shutdown of the other professional sports industries, esports has popped up, and then it's all rolled up into online betting. So, give me a, a high overview of esports in general, and then where your company comes into play, if you can. Sure, uh, esports is a is a subset of the overall video game industry. Uh, there's certain titles uh, in the in the video game uh, industry that lend themselves to uh, competitive play, league play, organized teams. So, technically, esports is organized professional teams and players playing against each other in tournaments for cash prizes. Okay, that's the esports category. Uh, I, I guess if we wanted to break that definition down, any uh, any video game two people are engaging in for a prize would qualify. But for our purposes, we're talking about professional teams, professional players, and organized tournaments for, as I say, for these cash prizes, some of which are uh, 20, 20, 25 million dollar purses. So these are this is not small time. This is this is the majors. This is so you're saying I should encourage my kids to continue playing for <laughs> yes. it's a whole professional new world, it's a whole new industry. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Um, and, and so what does your company do, sort of your segment to bring this all together? Sure. Well, we're focused on specifically on the gambling uh, aspect of esports. Okay. Just as, you know, sports book is a huge component of professional sports. I mean, you can go into any major casino anywhere in the world or go online to the reputable uh, mm. sports books. And all the major sports, uh, and this has been going on for well in in, in Europe for probably a hundred years, but certainly online since uh, since the 90s, and in every casino since they've been built, there's been a sports book component. Uh, two years ago, in sports book um, in the states, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the states that did have uh, a regulatory environment for online gaming could now do uh, sports book online. That started changing things quite rapidly. Uh, you're probably aware that the NFL owners started doing deals with the very sports books uh, for licensing rights, et cetera, and also sharing in the revenue. Uh, the reason they did that, uh, if we go back to 2018, and if I'm off on my numbers a little bit. Full disclosure, please, nobody's gonna hold you to it. Yeah, the general, the math on it was that the the owners, the NFL Owners Association, did about 15 billion in revenue, which is a staggering amount of money. It's huge, but that's everything. That's TV rights, gate, the works. Uh, the sports books, 
did 40 billion hmm. on those on the NFL. Okay. And uh, now the owners have all the overhead. The sports books have very little overhead. So you can see why the owners are motivated sure. to get a percentage of that. When you, sports, had, you, had, you had mentioned, but just to back up for a second to interrupt you, you had mentioned 2018. You know, what, what about it? I mean, what was the impetus that had, that allowed you to have that vision to think that this was something worth jumping into um, that early? And, and as a matter of fact, well, I have a, a twofold question. Number one is I read recently in a uh, in an article that quoted you um, as recently within the last month or two where you said that it's still early. So is it still early in the industry? Um, and and part B is, you know, that's a couple of years ago. How did you have the foresight to say this is something that's going to be around for a while? I want to get into it heavily. Versus, I don't know, it's going to come, it's going to go, it's a fad. What what was the impetus that 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 made you want to jump into it? Yeah, the aha moment for me actually came a few years earlier. It was in 2014. Uh, at 2014, I was asked by a group in Western Canada to investigate um, what was new in the online gambling business. They were looking at setting up a regulatory environment. It was a group of native tribes in Canada and doing something similar to what Kahnawagi had done outside of uh, Montreal, where they would sell licenses to conduct online gaming from their sovereign territory. Uh, I started looking around to see what was new in gaming because I, as you know, my background in the online gaming business goes back to the 90s. So I was right there at Genesis where it all started. I was going to ask you that. So let's let's digress even further. I'm going to keep interrupting you. That's so fine. I was going to say, is, do you have a background in, in gambling or do you have a background in playing video games? Like what, what, is, what does it take to get to fill the sure. seat that you're in right now? Well, I would say both because we had an Intellivision for those who really remember the early days. <laughs> <laughs> we had an Intellivision gaming system back in the 70s. Uh, that said... I'm, I'm, I'm strictly a Commodore 64 guy. That's it. <laughs> Gee, I adore my 64. <laughs> I, I remember it well. <laughs> having, having that, put that behind us for now, in 1996 to 1999, I was head of business development for one of the first three B2B platforms in the iGaming industry, StarNet, out in Western Canada. We put 23 operators online, uh, we were dealing with all the Breeders' Cup tracks, and they were all sports book and casinos. Uh, at that time, there was very few players. There, micro gaming was involved in the business. That was uh, Boss Media was involved in the business. This is even before CryptoLogic, and certainly long before you know Poker Stars. Um, and in 1999, the Canadian government decided that online gambling was not going to be happening in Canada, okay. and basically shut the company down and went to the, into the open arms of the Europeans and is now a $45 billion industry in Europe. Uh, and, you know, what can you say about yeah. that? Government decisions. That said, I left the industry in 99. And in 2014, I was contacted to help out uh, investigating, as I mentioned, with these Western tribes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Would, you know, help them. And I want to look what was new. In the, in the online gambling business because I hadn't been involved for many, many years. Uh, I had the good fortune of coming across two individuals, Ken Silva, who was the uh, head of esports, uh, the founder and president of Esports Canada, and Alex Lim, who was the secretary general of the International Esports Federation, who's on our board of directors now uh, out of Seoul, Korea. Wow. And uh, they advised me that I, they could talk to me all day long about esports because it was still very much a subculture in 2014. Uh, as far as the mainstream media is concerned, you know, for the fan base, you know, they had been, you know, there are fans that were already 10 years into it by that time. Uh, but I went to see the StarCraft Championship, uh, which is a title I wasn't familiar with, uh, at the International Center here in Toronto. And I, I was standing there outside with 5,020 somethings. Uh, and the promoters came out, are you ready to rumble? And it was a bit like a crossover yeah. between a concert, a sporting event, <laughs> you know, WWE. <laughs> event. And we all went in and they were yelling and there's lasers and smoke and music. <clears throat> they went into their chairs and they're making noise and the, they, they brought all the players out and there was a little bit of trash talking that went on and I wasn't sure what I was going to see. And they went into their respective PlayStation areas and, uh, uh, there was a color commentator and a narrator, and it was all broadcast on big screens, and everybody's just going hysterical over the gameplay. 
and I'm watching and they're betting with each other. And I was asking the organ Ken Silver, the organizer, and I said, what's, what's this all about? He goes, oh, this, this happens everywhere. There's really no good online places to bet. And sort of the proverbial aha moment was right there. I went back and I discussed it with the, the, the natives that I thought this was the future. They didn't want to pursue it. That's when I, we shook hands part of the ways friendly. And really? that's when I started the company. So that was, that was, that was really early. <laughs> really quite early. However, as with all things, uh, good ideas are one thing. Well, capitalize good ideas. <laughs> that's, a, that's another issue altogether. So I, I had you know some personal resources and I, I knew some people that I could go to and I went to them with this idea that this is what I thought was gonna be huge. They knew me from previous deals back in, in the, my previous gaming days. Uh, it was a group out of Denver and they wanted to work with me, but I had to uh, get a, a vehicle that they could finance uh, through and they could bring me investors. So I reached out to some securities attorneys that I knew and- now, now let me ask you right there, just have you ever at that point been involved in the public markets or run a public company beforehand? Uh, yes, I, I had in the dot-com era. I was, okay, you know, so you, uh, had, you had that experience. You weren't coming yes. into this no, I wasn't fun, into fun filled world of, of the public markets with, uh, with no experience. No, it was, my, it was my third time in being okay. a senior executive in a public okay. company. So I, uh, I, I understood, you know, what the, you knew what, you knew what you were getting yourself into. Yeah, the, the OTC, I, I, I had a bit of a, you know, I had been in the mosh pit there with uh, <laughs> in the, in the OTC. Uh, and I, I do some securities attorneys and I had to be quite frugal. It was all my own money. And uh, we found a, a gentleman who had uh, what was once an OTC firm that he couldn't afford to keep up and keep audited and had gone into the pinks. We did a, I had my own entity, which was an offshore entity, I banded it in, financed it, did, uh, got the audit done, brought it from the pink sheet, got it fully reporting, was able to move it up to the OTC QB. That took some time because uh, sure. there was four years of auditing that had to be done. Wow. Um, and got it up to the OTC QB, went back to the, got a license uh, in Ganawagi, uh, got a landing page done. So I, I probably put in about $180,000 and two years of sweat equity on top of that. I uh, got it, uh, went back to the fellas at, uh, in Denver and tragically, uh, the lead gentleman had uh, throat cancer oh, wow. and uh, died. Mm. So there I was. I had, I was beyond the point of no return. <laughs> right. So here we are uh, 20, <laughs> now into early days of 2017. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I did what, I, I guess you make a decision at that point in time. You just cut go, your losses. Go big or go home. Yeah, go big or yeah. get wow. it done, right? So I have a, uh, I don't know if it's a personality flaw or a benefit. I'm a fairly stubborn person when I get off <laughs> to a point and I, it takes a lot to shake me off center. So I basically called every single person in the world who would pick up the phone on the other side and talk them through what my vision was, what I wanted to do, started to get as many people excited about esports, which was starting in, in 2017, you were starting to see a lot more about esports. Okay. Uh, it was maturing. Uh, and how many people said, dumb idea, bad idea, don't know what you're talking about. It's a fad. Never going to happen. Don't waste your time. 90% of the people. 90%. So I want everybody that's listening to that to really focus in on that number. No commitments. 90%. So many times people will start a business and they're passionate about it or they're emotionally attached to it. Um, and people say no and people say it can't be done. And they, at some point, just throw up their hands and call it a day. They're like, if everybody tells me it can't be done, then it can't be done. But like you mentioned, you got to be pretty convinced and, and stubborn to take your, <laughs> take your ideas, so block out the naysayers, yes, I, and, uh, and pursue it. Grit are, are definitely qualities you need if you're going to if you're going to go public. It's not okay. for the faint of heart. And if you have a heart, uh, if you have a, a weak heart, you're probably going to die from a heart attack <laughs> in the process. <laughs> so I, I was a former uh, high performance athlete. I, I was okay. the captain of my rowing team. At, that explains it. So I, from a very traditional uh, sporting background. 
Uh, and also, as you can see, I'm not what you would consider a, 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 an esports fan. And I, I got a lot of pushback that uh, it's almost kind of a strange scenario because in esports, uh, the real experts, the players and the teams and the team owners are in their 20s. There's a few that are fairly long in the tooth that may be late 30s, but uh, to have somebody in their 50s, that was unheard of, really, uh, frankly. However, on the banking side, uh, the fund managers and banks aren't super keen about giving 25-year-olds fresh out of school money. Exactly. So you have this strange set of, you want experience and you need youth, and the two of those don't often go together very sure. well. And there are the odd, you know, genius, you know, Zuckerbergs that, that develop something that everyone right. has been part of. Uh, so I was wrestling with both of those. It was a very strange. Sir, I had one company flat out tell me it's a, it's a, it's a category that requires youth, and I'm afraid that they wouldn't back me because I was too old. I said, really? "Well, just straight I can't out, where you're coming from." Wow. <laughs> you know, every one of these uh, gray hairs is from experience, buddy. <laughs> and, uh, so. I, I, I believed, I believed in what it was. I believed the industry was going to be huge. I didn't know specifically when the gambling was going to kick in, Right. but I, I looked at it, you know, I was there in the early days of the online gaming. We took the first credit card hmm. transaction in Canadian e-commerce history hmm. at Starnet. We had to set it up with Bank of Montreal and that was providing a service to a mature industry. So we already knew sports book and casino was a mature industry in 1997. I didn't have to convince anybody that betting right. on a football game was something that right. people wanted to do. Clearly, they were already doing yeah. it. The question was, in those days, will people use their credit cards online? Do they trust the online credit card you know, processing centers? They're giving a credit card to a stranger online. It was bad enough they gave a credit card to a waitress in a restaurant. Right. Yeah. It seems <laughs> so like you, I mean, there, were, there were so many issues. I mean, you've got... You've got the credit card, you've got the industry being an unknown or an unproven. Um, you've got probably more elements of regulation concern than, than most industries. Oh. Um, it's, it's kind of just coming at you from all angles. And yet there were no there were laser focus regulatory bodies. Antigua, we worked with the Antiguan government to set it up. Oh, I, want, I wanted to talk to you about that because Grant, I'm going to be honest with you. In my industry, when I wanted to get like you know, SEC filings or, or stock transfer agent, I got to jump on a plane. I got to go to Cleveland or like Minnesota. There's no place exotic. I read someplace like you're traveling to all these foreign countries. And first of all, do you do a lot of travel? Under normal circumstances, yes. Yes, I, I mean, I mean under normal circumstances. Pre, pre these unique times, yes. yes. You do a lot of travel. What type yeah, of we had an office. I mean, as, as the story will progress, you'll see that this was a very circuitous route. This was not a direct path. Okay. There's no geometric shapes in here. Uh, you know, so we, you know, the challenge was, I believed in this case, the esport fan base. Uh, you know, Twitch was early days for Twitch TV. Right. Um, but they, you know, I, I think it was four guys who started that up and it's a, it's a billion dollar uh, sure. platform now. And, you know, we, I knew it was getting huge. Everything's online. You know, the fan base has no problem sharing the most intimate secrets online with almost anybody as it turns mm -hmm. out. So we knew that getting the credit card information and people being comfortable with that wasn't going to be an issue. The question was, do they want to bet? Uh, now I had seen it firsthand that they do bet. So what are what are the elements that have to be in place before they're comfortable to bet? And you know it's starting to be figured out now. There's you know companies that are doing quite well. I mean there's skins betting, there's gray market operators. There's some very good operators out there, no question, that are running some sports book uh, type betting. And now that esport now that sports is shut down, the only sports being bet on right. is right. Uh, but, you know, when I was looking at it back in those days, before all these big operators would get into it, you know, the 365s, Pinnacle, were not really, they were just bits and pieces in, in, in esports. And the Unicorn was out there. And I think um, Betson had, was doing some work in esports, but it was a handful. Okay. Five, six, you know, companies that were looking at it. 
And I felt, and I was talking, obviously I was talking to Ken, I was talking to Alex. Uh, we, we hired a couple of eSports team owners who are on our marketing team. I'm very close to some of the guys who used to be at Dream Act, Magnus, who's one of my advisors, who's head of the partnerships. So I was running ideas by them. What, what do they think? What do they think is going to resonate with the fan base? And it was a, a number of elements because back then CSGO Lounge was a big, you know, a big, big blow up. And, you know, it was a Russian operator who was taking bets from American miners. And, you know, it was a huge headache. It was a skins betting platform. And I think that 7 billion had been wagered over a couple of years. Yeah. And millions of this was with miners. So that was a big problem. So you had a credibility issue, transparency issues, confidence issues. It was a really you know, the regulators check, didn't check, like check, it. Check, check, check. Yeah, all the negative things, <laughs> regulators just keep up at Okay. And so we felt, okay, we're going to have to approach this. Uh, you know, the, the fans, what we were told, they don't really like that fan versus the house model. This mm -hmm. is a traditional sports book where you take my money, you give me the odds, and then you try and beat me mm -hmm. while you're holding my money. Okay. That's, it actually is kind of a bizarre Sorry, if you think about it, works well for the handicappers because you know then they're testing their knowledge against the bookmaker. Sure. Uh, but in esports, what the feedback we got was the player versus player model. They like to test their their knowledge against the other fans. Uh, if you go to on on any of the chat groups, you'll see that they're always trying to one up each other. Who knows more about whom and what play and guess who's going to beat beat them. I, I read somewhere that 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 you had this tagline that a player always wins. When, on our side, yes. On your side, yeah. So now, it, it, of course, you know, you've always got to be prepared to evolve. Sure. That's also true. You can't be stagnant. And, you know, we did find that some fans, some fans, as the industry is starting to get some traction in gaming, some fans do like that fixed odd betting, the traditional sports book model. Okay. So you want to have it. It's not what I want the fans to bet on. It's what do the fans want to bet on and sure. then that product to them. Okay. So we have the fantasy betting. We have the pools betting. We have the fixed odds betting. Mm -hmm. We have in-game exchange betting. Uh, we're working on adding skins betting and additional pool style bets. Uh, so getting back to where I was going with that long narrative is that we had a lot of feedback that they like that player versus player, PVP. They, they liked it. So it's a game within the bet. Okay. Right? Uh, so we had to tick that box off. That's what we wanted on the site. And we did put an exchange up, but it was based on, it, it, you know, the software was full of bugs, unfortunately, but uh, the traditional bet exchange model, it's not intuitive. It didn't track. You know, it's, as you know, making a successful company is often full of trial and error. Yeah, sure. Um, thankfully, you know, like there are companies in this business who have spent a hundred million dollars on trial and error. Thankfully, that was only a million or so. Okay. You, know? uh, you got to be easy. A lot of knowledge is gained. It, it's only a waste of money if you don't learn anything. From right. It. Uh, and then we, you know, it was, we doubled down on being public because transparency. Okay. The ultimate transparency, to use an esports term, the overwatch of the okay. SEC. Yes. A regulatory body that can actually arrest somebody if yes. they're doing something, you know, unsavory. That doesn't exist anywhere else. The gaming commissions can find people and they can seize assets, but they don't have arrest and seizure power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's it's a different it's a different level altogether. So we felt okay, let's focus our energy there because that will put us in a category of you know we'll have the player versus player. We check that model. We have to check the box that we are transparent. It was key. All the feedback we had from every corner, transparent. And at that time, were there any other publicly traded companies in that space? Uh, not in. Uh, or not, not that many. There were, there's traditional sports book operators that sure. were public in, okay. in uh, Europe, on, on London and Sweden, that were offering some esports at that time. Okay. There was nobody in North America and nobody in a major exchange. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. London's a major exchange, clearly. That said, the, the next step was content. And, you know, one, one mistake that people make, they talk about esports, like it's like NFL and then esports. Well, that's like sports is NFL, rugby, hockey, NBA. There's 
dozens of, there's five or six major sports. Okay. There's tennis, volleyball, the list goes on and on and on. That's sure. all sports. Same thing in esports. Esports isn't one homogenous community. It's oh, nine, 10 major titles and then dozens of other smaller mm -hmm. titles. As a matter of fact, okay. one of the groups we're working with last week in England did $35,000 in handle on virtual volleyball. <laughs> I never would have thought that. And had it not been COVID infused, probably wouldn't have happened. <laughs> right. There you have it. It's changed. You wow. got to have it that people want. So, you know, esports, the big titles, you know, CSGO and Dota and League and clearly everybody knows about Fortnite and you know, there's Rocket League. There's several, there's several okay. major titles that go to major tournaments and have, you know, hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions of dollars in cash prizes. So, you know, we wanted to have a site that had, you know, lots of streaming and content. Uh, so we've now got that site. Okay. That site's up and by GG, we have the transparency. As a matter of fact, we are the first company, first iGaming company ever U.S. listed to list on a major U.S. exchange. And then we did that in the middle of a global pandemic. Congratulations. In a financial market that hasn't been seen since the Great Depression. So let's talk, let, let's let's talk about that because I, I you know it's funny I posted something on LinkedIn the other day about that you know people look at that and they're like oh wow that's that company you know I can't believe they did it but but let's let's be honest it it didn't get done that week I mean you've been planning <laughs> this and working on this for months I mean oh, well, yeah. the heavy lifting probably happened the last you know whatever it is week two weeks three weeks between you and the the bankers and the lawyers and the and, and the exchange oh, but but well, this isn't. You're right. This is a, a six month, maybe more endeavor. Well, yeah. If I was to pick up, the, I mean, we were just talking here, but uh, yeah. pick up the, the journey after, after, you know, the gentleman in, in Denver died and there I was, I was calling people up and then I, I thought, well, how the hell am I going to get a couple million bucks? I mean, I, I'm going to have to call a million people. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have billionaires on my, on my personal friend list. Uh, so it, it was a little bit of a challenge. So I had to get creative. And uh, I was looking at the time, because I, I knew Antigua. I knew Antigua was a once upon a time was one of the premium jurisdictions for online gaming. And has okay. fallen you know, off the list, uh, mostly because of the banking. But they had at the time something called a citizenship by investment programs, kind of like your EB-5 program in the US where people could fast track a citizenship right. by making an investment in, in the country. And the CIP program, to get approved, you had to have an idea that would be of economic benefit to the citizens of Antigua. So I had proposed taking, there was a property down there, and people who have followed our company for a while know about this. There's the Grand Princess. It was, in, it was it's a huge, beautiful facility that was built. Uh, God knows why it was built in Antigua. Okay. 63,000 square foot casino uh, in a country where you know, the, the next biggest casino is maybe 4,000 square feet. Really? Yeah. That big of a difference. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It looks like the Bellagio in Antigua. It's a sleepy little vacation place. You know, we're not oh. talking about Atlantis and, and, you know, it's that size of casino. Right. In Antigua. And, you know, they, they used to say the people who go to Antigua are the newlywed or the nearly dead. I mean, that's the kind of tourism it's got. <laughs> Um, so I don't know why it was built, but it was built and it was just sitting there in mothballs for years. And I had the idea that why don't I go down, work with the citizenship by investment program. Uh, so I'll use the money, acquire this facility, turn it into an esports destination. Wow. And I got all the way through <clears throat> council. I went all the way through approvals. I had a Chinese group in the CIP willing to work with us. I had the engineering reports, it took months, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We set up an office, we had staff, we were good to go. And uh, that was right when 60 Minutes did a bit of an expose that some people on the U.S. watch list had been getting Antiguan passports. Really? Uh, and there I was <clears throat> walking into the prime minister's office looking for that final good housekeeping seal of approval. He looked me right in the eye and said, I can't do it. Wow. <laughs> so Unbelievable. that was my second about turn because oh. you know, the guy that died, right, died right. This, this thing, and this was another year. 
in preparation, hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent. So I, I went back uh, to my room and did what probably anybody would do at that time. I took a bottle of wine and drank it as quick as I could. <laughs> as, long as, as long as we're clear about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, that didn't work. What's next? How am I going to keep pushing this thing forward? Still laser focused. I, yeah, there was, like I said, it takes a lot to knock me off my point. Wow. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this isn't working. Uh, Antigua is obviously not going to be where I'm going to go. So I went out and got a Curacao license and kept on moving forward, raised some more money. I had decided I was going to go on the Canadian Stock Exchange. I had prepared, prepared, I started drafting a non-offering prospectus and was going to take the OTC uh, company listed on the exchange. I had some contacts in Toronto, a little bit of support. So I was going down that path and I started working with Red Chip. It's a US IR firm, uh, Dave Gentry and his team. And he recommended I go to the LD Micro Show out in California. Uh, Shout out to uh, Chris Lahiji. Yep. Okay. Uh, and he said, after you do that show, go to New York. I want you to meet some of my friends in the banking community in Manhattan. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll talk to anybody, like I said, who's willing to talk to me. Yeah, about you've, already, you've already proven that theory. Speak, <laughs> speak to anybody and everybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. uh, so I uh, rolled through Manhattan and there was three, three banks who were quite interested because keep in mind, that was the spring. Now, now we're in 2018. Spring okay. of 2018. SCOTUS comes out with the announcement online gambling, sports books allowed with the states would have the regulatory body, which is why you've seen this bit of a gold rush by the states setting up regulatory bodies. Uh, I believe now we're 15, 16, where there was only three at the time. Wow. Uh, and on, I've, I've, it, what I'm talking to suggest, you know, in another four or five years, there'll probably be 30 states, maybe more that will have these gaming regulatory bodies in place. And that's great. It's a, it's a, it's a clear, people love to do it clearly. And it's, it's a, it's a revenue generator for the States. So okay. people want to do it. Why wouldn't the States offer it sure. to the people who want to do it? So there I was <laughs> in New York and these three banks said, uh, uh, we're very interested. And I sat and the one that really sticks with me is, and was our underwriter on this deal was Joseph Gunner. Uh, I said, I'm going to do this in Toronto. And Steve Stein looked at me and said, this is not going to be a Toronto Stock Exchange deal. This is going to be a NASDAQ deal. We want this deal. That's when everything changed. Another, so, another aha moment. Wow. Okay. That's because the world had changed. I'd been stubborn enough to stay in it. I did have a site. I did have a license. Sure. You know, granted, you know, my time and energy was clearly being dedicated towards the end game, which is getting on a, a, a bigger exchange, getting that transparency piece and getting access to capital. So we, uh, we started on that journey and that would be the fall of 2018 finally. And they raised us some money, uh, $3 million in fact. So we pushed forward on the S1. Uh, as we got closer to the S1, our Canadian auditors were feeling terribly uncomfortable about being a Canadian auditor on a US gap deal. Uh, so we had, to, we had to change auditors. You, we were using UH by McGovern Hurley here in Toronto. Great firm, but they're not, you know, their expertise is Toronto, which is what we were going to do. We're now here to New York. So in the third quarter, we had to change auditors in the middle of an S1 registration statement. So our BB came on. This is great info. This is really great information, Grant, because it shows, this is real. This is real. This shows, you know, people think like, oh yeah, you want to go out, raise money, you know, just hire a lawyer, hire an auditor, you know, 60 to 90 days, right? The famous 60 to 90 days, I'll get it done. But this is, this is real. This is the, the, the yeah, pitfalls and, and the uh, challenges yeah. and the unexpected. And, you know, this is, this is what it's like. Yeah, I, I don't know who said it. I, I keep thinking it was somebody like Patton, but it you know it's a famous military general, and anybody can have a plan, but it's all going to change once the shoot starts. It's true. It's true. <laughs> okay, so you had to switch auditors. So we switched to auditors, and uh, we had planned at that the plan was, and the money was raised for a budget to get up June thirtieth. That's when we were going to go at, at just you know, hopefully before June thirtieth, so we didn't get too close. The SEC would slow us down. The auditors weren't comfortable. 
They weren't, they had just taken on a company. Not only were we in the middle of an S1 registration statement, which makes auditors particularly uh, detail oriented, understandably, uh, we're a gambling company. They'd never had a gambling pro company uh, as a client and esports was a foreign word to them. Yeah. Sounded like something we'd made up, had to probably go check out on Wikipedia, what was that? So we had a whole bunch of things that made them nervous. And as you know, when auditors are nervous, they'll go at their own speed, thank you very much. Sure. So we, we got so far along in the process and we, we did get the K done, of course. We needed, we needed an extension on the Q, got the K done. But now the numbers had stale dated for the S1. So we had to redo the S1. Then we had to go back to the banks and say, okay, we need additional capital because clearly our time horizon has been pressed out. It's the summertime, don't want to do an IPO in the summertime. Uh, and of course the bridge holders, I don't know if your clients have ever worked with note holders, but suffice it to say, when there's an opportunity to advance their position, you can count on, <laughs> they will take that opportunity and they did. Right, right. So that caused a diff, an additional heartache and <laughs> stress. Wow. It doesn't need to be a combative process, but for reasons that are beyond any issuer's control, it is a bit of a well, that, that, that just that just shows you know anybody listening to this another element is that in addition to everything that you've spoken about which is the tremendous challenge on the business side of of fighting through whether it's regulation whether it's the industry whether it's finding the capital on top of all that full time um to get to where you were you've also got an entirely different role to play and that's the compliance and the shareholders and and dealing with um with their expectations um, it is easily two full-time jobs. Well, it is. And unfortunately, unless you have the resources, and some are fortunate enough that they do. I, I wasn't in that category. So I... But we're talking about companies like yours that are starting off small yeah. and, and growing as you have. So, it's, so you have to sort of see where your time is best spent. Right. Right. And, you know, That's I good advice. Okay. I was committed to getting onto the NASDAQ. Once, okay. once I was pitched on the NASDAQ, I loved the idea, fell in love with it. I was not going to be discouraged <laughs> from that path. So the, you know, I, I unfortunately couldn't really nurture the business. It, it, the process for what it's worth when it gets down to commissions and et cetera, I'll talk about that later because it, it, it is, it is sticker shock. You're going to have sticker shock. You, you, what you think it is, it's going to be more. That's all that I'm going to say about that. So we got through the process, got the S1 revised. The banks felt that it would be better to syndicate, bring in another bank. So, you know, Gunner invited Maxim in the deal, bigger bank. They had to do their due diligence. Now we're into the fall. And uh, the company we were dealing with that was our platform provider effectively went bankrupt. Uh, you know, they just, the site shut down. Can't make the stuff up. <laughs> you can't make the stuff up. So, uh, that is what it is. Yep. So, okay. Now, I, I had a sense that there was going to be some issues there. Uh, so, I had started talking to other options, other operators, and we, we did have something we were able to move into place fairly quickly, like in a few days. We have, I have, you know, Alan Alden, one of our directors in, in Malta, who was, 20 years in the business, actually was the chairman of the technical audit committee for the, the Malta Gaming Authority and is spearheading our application in Malta. Uh, he was very helpful at that time. And uh, the good people over at uh, Altenar and IGA helped us out a lot. And we, we were able to put something up very quickly uh, as we're going through this process. However, now we're looking at the holiday season. Hmm. And uh, the banks and we sat down. And for me, I felt like I was forever circling the airport. <laughs> and I had long ago run out of fuel, right? I'm sure. So here we were uh, looking at the holiday season. Uh, then we agreed, or I had to agree, we were going to push this to the new year. Made sense. Made sense for everybody. Get through the new year, have to update the S1. And then, you know, we, we had the new Q figures coming out. So we had to wait till the Q was done to update the S1 again. That's right. Can't have those numbers go stale. No. Nope. Can't let it go stale. Okay. And I, that's a process. I understand why the process there. As sure. a matter of fact, that's why I want it to be on the NASDAQ. Because of these processes right. and the transparency it gives the players and the investors. Right. 
Uh, but again, it's a regulatory process that's fairly unforgiving and it's absolutely exhausting and uh, quite expensive, as you can imagine, because whether you're Google or a little startup micro cap. At least, uh, come on, between the lawyers, the auditors, and the bankers, at least the transfer agent fees aren't that bad. Yeah, no, you guys, you guys are free <laughs> by comparison. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, so that time frame then, so, that brings you what, till March? Yeah, we you know that takes us into, I guess it was end of January, early February, we were ready to have a go. Then we had a, a disgruntled ex-employee issue that, uh, you know, he was making noise with a lot of the uh, mm. bankers and the auditors. So we had to, I was in New York getting ready to go on the road show, but they, they wanted to be comfortable. Everybody wants to be comfortable. So we had to <laughs> stop the presses again. That took two weeks to get that sorted out. And they realized that uh, one of the two of us was lying. Turns out it wasn't me. <laughs> Thankfully. Good. So, Onward we went. I get down to the road show, finally, and that was uh, <clears throat> last about February twentieth. The last ten days of February were finally, finally, finally. The S one's been done many times. Everybody's looked at everything. We've done the presentation. <clears throat> Off I go. I start in New York. Do New York. Um, Actually, you and I managed to get together for a little bit at that time. With That's the, right. Yeah. You know, did New York, did Long Island, left New York, headed down to Miami. At that time, at that time, we were just starting to hear little bits and pieces about the coronavirus in, in, in China. It was coming up as kind of an odd oddity that we would discuss here and there and at these meetings. But it wasn't, it hadn't really hit North America. In fact, it hadn't really broke out in Europe too much. It started to see bits and pieces in Italy, of course. It's funny because you said that, that, as a matter of fact, the day that I met you, we met like towards the end of the day in the evening. Yeah. And, and I was coming from a, from a meeting with a group that was looking to take their company public. They were, they were in from China and they were sort of hunkered down and stuck here because they couldn't go back home. Right. And, and, and I just kept thinking to myself, like, wow, I can't imagine. What, what must that be like that you can't go back home? Like, they're stuck yeah. here at the pause or whatever. And, um, yeah, so that, that must have been the very early stages. Oh, things, yeah. Uh, it broke out. Days. Got to Miami. And, and flying into Miami, I flew in or into Fort Lauderdale, excuse me, in a thunderstorm, which, yeah. Uh, Never fun. There are better ways to fly than to, <laughs> to land during a thunderstorm. So that was, you know, that had its own elements to it. But good meetings uh, all through Miami. And then I was flying up to Chicago the next day uh, because of the storms. Flight was delayed, delayed. I was supposed to take off about 7 o'clock. I didn't take off till 11 o'clock at night. Uh, I think I landed in Chicago 1 o'clock in the morning, Chicago time. And the meetings are starting at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I have an online phone call with a, a group out of uh, Italy. So uh, I met with uh, the banker uh, in his hotel room. We have our first call with, with, a, with a German group at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then we head off. Uh, we had, uh, I think, seven meetings in Chicago. A long day, met in the airport. We're sitting in the airport having a beer and we're talking about, you know, taking sort of stock of all the meetings we've had. Right. Uh, this was the first leg uh, of, uh, I think by now we'd had, gosh, I'm going to say 20 some odd meetings in, in over three days in three different cities. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You mean you don't just sit back and the money comes to you? It's not the way it works? I was, I was doing presentations in the car between meetings where I was going to present. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just talking and talking. Presentations between class? presentations. Okay. That's yeah, what it I, takes. I, I, what people I, have to understand that's what it takes. People talk about road shows and you, you think, you know, I've, I've given hundreds of well, thousands of presentations in my life, but the level of concentration and the organization that goes in, I mean, we have two banks, they're setting up meetings. There's a car. I walk out the door. There's a car there taking you to the meeting. A banker's in the, by the way, we have a call on the way to this next meeting. Wow. So we're doing a pitch in the, in the it's car. It's for people to understand that. That's what it takes to, to get these things done. It's quite a perform. And you're on. You always yeah. got, you're tired. That's too bad. Right. Get, get another coffee yep. in this. Yeah. Well, what do you need? <laughs> you know, let's get going. 
and you're pitching people that are eating food that you're paying for and you don't have time to eat because you got to go to the next meeting. So we're, we go through this. We're in the, we're in Chicago airport, O'Hare airport after the end of the Chicago trip. And we're talking about, and we're still, we're, the banker's still calling people. We're pitching them at the bar. <laughs> and we're still settling. So now it's uh, six o'clock at night. Uh, and we're having a beer and uh, we're hearing more and more about Corona. It's starting mm. to become now kind of a steady part of everybody's conversation. Mm. And it's becoming a little more concerning because now it's starting to pop up. It's definitely entrenched now. In, in Italy and in Europe, they're starting to right. be very concerned. There's a lot of reports. And um, I, I was heading back to Toronto for a day's rest. Uh, so I get back to Toronto and I'm flying out Sunday night to LA. So I get up and I'm going to the airport. I'm just reading the news on my phone and now it's full blown in, in Europe. Coronavirus is hit and uh, you know, Italy is in a state of emergency and it started to spread into Spain, mm -hmm. state of emergency and other states. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really something. Wow. Okay. And I was so focused on the road show. I get out to uh, San Francisco, sorry, Let's go to San Francisco. It was definitely everywhere by now in San Francisco. They were starting to lock down certain things. I was doing presentations to some, um, some companies on the street in front of their building because we weren't allowed into the building. At that point already. At that wow. point. So I make a presentations on the street. Uh, some offices we're going into. Some people want to meet, uh, you know, a third a third party location in a restaurant or whatever. So wow. a lot of coffee shop meetings, etc. Finish up in, very successfully. And as I'm leaving San Francisco, one of the banks, uh, Gunner calls says, "You know, you're killing it, man. We're going to be way oversubscribed. Way oversubscribed. This is awesome. Everybody loves it." So I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> Playing, go down to LA. We intentionally, you know, we're making light of things. I'm drinking a Corona beer in the airport. There's a couple people walking around with masks on, but it was very rare, like two, three people, maybe not too many. And we get down to, to LA, and we have two days of meetings in and around LA. Uh, you know, the NBA was still on. We were thinking to go to see a, a, a Lakers game, but we. Right. I was just too tired. <laughs> You know, I, I, was, I, I was going around and I, at this time I'm with uh, both. I have Max and, and, uh, and Gunner with me. Okay. And we had lots of great meetings uh, and we, we finished up and uh, the, the, I was with the Gunner guys and they said, would you like to go? It was like, I think nine o'clock at night. We were all done. We'd finished our last, last dinner meeting. He said, you want to go grab a beer? And I said, yeah, maybe. And then I started walking. I said, you know what? I'm so tired. I think I'm going to throw up. I, I, just, I just, actually, I don't want a beer. I don't want to go to bed. If it's all the same view, I don't want to bed. Like, yeah, no, whatever. He goes, I think I'm going to go. You, you, you do what you want. Well, I, I went to bed. We, we got up in the morning. Oh, we had more meetings that day. So we had a couple more meetings okay. before we went to the airport. He goes, yeah, I got to my room and, uh, I thought I'd lay down for a nap and I woke up at eight o'clock in the morning. Really? <laughs> we were both just I'm not surprised. Spent, we were both just spent, had one, one more meeting, then off to the airport uh, and, and back. They were going to fly me back to New York. So this is now, I think, March 5th, 4th, 5th. And I, I said, do I have any meetings actually in somebody's office? They said, well, no, you're going to come back to the bank. We're going to just have some meetings in the boardroom. I said, that's all the same view. I'm going to fly back to Toronto and just have those calls right. from home. We'll just do a uh, zoom. Makes sense, right. Right. Which turned out to clearly be the right move. Uh, so I get back and we have these calls and then everything, hits. everything breaks, breaks everything point, falls right. apart over that weekend. Literally over so that at some weekend. point did they just call you and say, listen, deals on hold. It's not, this well, not gonna happen now. yeah, they, they called me up on Monday. They said, look, this is not looking great. Um, we're thinking we need to push it a week, see how things see how things go. So we right. have to adjust the, the registration statement. Uh, then the next week comes. And you know, while while this is happening, as you know, the stock market, NASDAQ and the Dow were down two thousand points, sure, sure. SPs falling apart, everybody's panicking in the oil industry, the Russians and Saudis are fighting. 
it was like this perfect storm of bad news on top of right. the coronavirus. So as, as one person's deciding they want to come in, two people are dropping out. So we're going from, we already had over 11 million in commitments to nine, to mm. eight, to seven. And uh, frankly, what happened was we just had to really double down on the efforts. Really? I called people, talked to them, talked them through, you know, and the one industry that started to boom because professional sports was shut down, the entertainment industry was locked down, people were in their houses and a magical thing happened. Everybody, sports has arrived. <laughs> everybody went online. <laughs> And they went online and uh, they were doing their YouTube and they were watching the videos of cats in boxes and people rubbing their dog's belly and put makeup on them and stuff, of course. We've all seen those and they are hilarious. So I've watched a few of those myself. But what was happening was people who loved sports were starting to fall in love with esports. Of course, they needed something. And, you know, yes, they were playing their console games, but what was really started to track was the digital games of the traditional sports, the 2K League. Even the NBA players formed their own NBA 2K League mm. against other NBA players. Right. You know, Madden was taking off, the NHL was taking off. As I say, digital volleyball. That right, was taking off. So it, uh, we were able to bring these fresh numbers to these presentations. Hey, you know, Twitch is up. 15%. That's great. Steam platform crashed because of the usage. You know, uh, and so we were able to hold on to the ones who believed, not just looking for a quick flip in an IPO, because sure, sure. a lot of the investors, they just look for the IPO flip and they're on to the next deal. You know, IPO stock, they always get a couple special perks. We had to restructure our deal a little bit. We were able to hold on to the, the fans, the fanatics, the believers. And, uh, and when and let me ask you this: when you, when you were actually two questions, what what gave you the confidence to say, despite the fact that the world is falling apart, and and obviously health wise aside, we hope that you know at that time everybody um, you know was okay from a health standpoint. But despite the market crashing, what gave you the confidence to be able to say, you know what, I'm still going to move ahead and I'm still going to uplist? And number two is what was the um, like did the exchange itself have any reaction? Did they, were they encouraging of it? Did they say you were crazy for trying to pull it off? <laughs> I think by now, that's a given. Everybody okay. had, at this point in time, <laughs> that was entirely possible. Uh, I, I think, had we not finished the roadshow, and had we not had such tremendous positive response on the face-to-face -face meetings, I, I think the banks might well have thrown the towel away, mm -hmm. uh, frankly. Uh, but we did have uh, a substantial response and, you know, I had a, a lot of support from you know, the banks. I had a lot of support from our, our attorneys uh, who in fact actually invested, which is a very unusual set of circumstances. So the terrific guys and, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to give out names on these types of casts. Go, go look at the S1. You can see who the yeah, attorneys exactly. are. We'll give them a big shout out that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I did what I, where I started. I got back on the phone and I started calling. In the end, I, I raised a third of it myself. Wow. wow. That's yeah. a great, listen, it's a great story, you know, from start to finish, from the business standpoint, from the, going public standpoint, I think anybody who just listened to the last uh, hour or so is going to take away a lot of valuable lessons. Just know what it takes to be successful in business, persistence, um, expectations. Yeah. Well, Seth, as I mentioned uh, when we were just casually talking, right up until 1230 at night, the day before we were going effective, we were still on the phones, working people, working, wow. you know, making sure, double checking. And if you're not prepared to do that, particularly, probably at any point in time, but particularly now, it's not the right play for you. You know, going public is, it's, it's a hell of a lot of work. And it should be, because well, it's not for everybody. Well, that's the takeaway. Going public is a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> but, um, well, listen, I appreciate your time and the story. And um, I think people have learned a lot about about you, about the company. Again, ticker symbol, GMBL, um, on the NASDAQ exchange. 
Congratulations again. Um, and uh, I think we all learned a very valuable, I know I learned about a very valuable lesson about persistence and about uh, if you believe in something to stick with it. So uh, thank you for teaching that to me. And I look forward to getting together uh, in person when this is all over. Yes, I look forward to it. All right, okay. thanks, Great to talk to you.